Hi, people. I'm Carlos Luna, content producer here at Roll20. And if you're curious about running or playing your first game of Dungeons and Dragons, this video will tell you the core ideas and mechanics behind the game so you can start playing as quickly as possible. Okay, so D&D has been around for many, many years now, and it's currently in its fifth edition, which means there are a lot of books. That being said, you don't need all these books to start playing the game. Actually, you don't need any of the books to start playing. D&D has what's called an SRD, which is short for System Reference Document. It includes the base monsters, classes, and races for D&D. So if this is a game you've been thinking about playing, but you're not ready to buy books and dice and maps and all that, just go to Roll20.net and start a free account. Okay, in this video, I'll go over how the D&D system works, how to create your own characters, and some best practices for running your first session. The first half of this video is good for players and GMs, but the second half is geared more towards GMs running the game. Also, in the description below, I'll add some timestamps so you can jump around and I'll include an actual play of people playing Dungeons and Dragons so you can get a feel for how the game moves. D&D the easy way. Okay, in Dungeons and Dragons, you take on the role of a character, sort of like in a video game, and you control every action of your character. What they say, where they move, how they behave. That being said, I can explain D&D in three easy steps. Step one, description. The dungeon master describes the environment or the situation to the players. They might say something like, you're in a dark hallway and you hear heavy breathing. Step two, choice. The players describe what they want their character to do. I want to light my torch. Step three, results. After some dice are rolled, the GM narrates the results of the player's choices. You light the torch and you see three goblins staring at you. And that's it. That's D&D. That's all you really have to know. If you have a question on a monster or an item, you can flip through a book or use Roll20 search option, but all your questions will be answered by you. So you can never be wrong. These are just suggested answers. Creating your game. Okay, we're looking to play virtually on Roll20, so we need to create our game first. Make sure you're logged in and hover over games at the top. Now click create new game. Give your game a name. I'll call this first D&D game. And then choose a character sheet. Select D&D 5e by Roll20, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Now for this example, I'm gonna be using the pre-made adventure Lost Mine of Fandelver to show you a game all set up. But if you don't have this book or any book, don't worry at all. You don't need one to start playing. I just wanted you to see the possibilities of D&D. Great, you're now on your game's landing page where you can invite players, schedule your game, and tweak your settings. Let's send out an invite to our players so we can all learn together. Click invite players and add their email or copy a link at the bottom and send it to them. When they click on the link, they'll be right in the game. So let's join them. Click the launch game button. Okay, character sheets. Okay, I have the Lost Mine and Fandelver starter adventure, which actually comes with pre-generated character sheets. All I have to do is scroll down, click that character sheet, hit edit, and assign it to one of my players. Great, I don't have to do any character creation. This is a perfect scenario if I want to start playing the game right away and I don't want to necessarily learn the ins and outs of creating a character. If that describes you, go ahead and click the description below and jump ahead to the next section. We're going to be creating a new character from scratch because it really helps everyone learn the game as they go. Scroll back up to the top, click add and then character. Now this pop up right here lets you add artwork and assign the character sheet to a player. If they've already logged into the game, you can assign this character sheet to them. If they haven't, you have to wait till they click that link that you sent in the beginning. Great, click the character sheet tab, then use the character mancer. Now, the character mancer will guide you through the process of creating a character. I actually have another video on that, but I'm gonna go over the big key components of the character sheet. So up first, 
race. Now, a character's race determines their ancestry, where they grew up, who their parents are, and what they look like. Are you a tusk half-orc that lowers over your companions? Or are you more of a rosy cheek gnome? Each race has different racial abilities, like gnome cunning or relentless endurance. Each does something unique, so be sure to read the text before you select your race. Class. Now, classes represent what your character has dedicated countless hours learning and perfecting. Maybe they've trained as a mercenary to become a formidable fighter, or maybe they spent years at a magic university studying tomes to become a powerful wizard. Whatever class you choose will really define your character, giving them abilities, proficiencies, and equipment they might have gathered in their training. Ability scores. Ability scores represent a character's physical and mental prowess. There are six abilities in D&D, and most of them are pretty straightforward. Strength is your character's bodily power. Dexterity represents agility and reflexes. Constitution ties into your character's health and stamina. Intelligence shows your book smarts, while wisdom, your street smarts. And finally, charisma is your character's confidence and leadership. Each of these abilities will have a score. The higher the ability score, the better your character will be at using that ability. Now, there are a few different ways for getting your ability scores. Some people like rolling dice, while others like getting their points from a pool. But today, we're going to be using a method called Standard Array, which I think is the easiest. Remember how there's six abilities that you need scores for? Well, great. Here are six numbers you can choose from. 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and eight. Assign them abilities, don't be late. I wrote that right now, sorta. Now, when you're deciding where to put each score, keep in mind your character's class. Each class usually revolves around one or two abilities. For example, a wizard uses their intelligence to learn and cast spells, while a fighter who wields a longsword will be using strength to deal damage. Psst, here's a helpful list of abilities each class focuses on to help you and your table out. It's pretty cool. Why do I have to whisper though? Okay, once you have placed each score into an ability, your race gives you a little bump to two scores. Warding, warding, ward. Okay, the following is a little number crunchy, but again, you do not have to memorize this or even learn this part if you don't want. Roll20 will automatically do this math for you. This is more just so you know how the numbers are affecting your character sheet. Okay, if you're using a character sheet, add two points to any score you wish and then choose any other score and add one point to it. Maybe you come from a lineage of scholarly half-orcs and you're choosing to bump up your intelligence by two and your wisdom by one. After making your final adjustments to your abilities, we can figure out each ability modifier that will go in the box above your score. Okay, so you have abilities and ability modifiers. Ability modifiers are what will be added or subtracted to your roles. So figuring out your modifier is very easy. It all starts at the ability score of 10. Now this is the average ability score and we'll have a modifier of zero for every two points above or below 10. This will either add one or subtract one. So if you have an ability of 14, you go up two. If you have an ability of eight, you go down one. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. If you're wondering, what do you do with an odd number, like 11? Nothing. The modifier only increases or decreases on even numbers. I'm so sorry if that's confusing. Skills. Now each skill is tied to an ability, but it represents a more specific aspect of that ability. For example, history is an intelligence-based skill. So the higher your intelligence is, the better you are at history. Again, don't worry about memorizing these skills and how they correlate to the ability. There's actually gonna be little notes on the character sheet that tell you which ability affects which skill. For the most part, when using these skills, you'll simply just add your ability modifier to whatever you rolled on your 20-sided dice. Proficiency bonus. Okay, I just fibbed a little bit in that last section. You'll actually be adding your modifier and your proficiency bonus in that skill if you have one. 
Proficiency means that your character has spent extra time in their life focusing on that skill. So when you use a skill in what you have proficiency in, you add your proficiency bonus in addition to your ability. So you would roll a d20, add your ability modifier, and then your proficiency bonus. But again, roll 20 does all that math for you. You just, you just click a button. At level one, your proficiency bonus is plus two, and this will get higher as you level up. Now I mentioned background a few seconds ago. This is the final part in creating a character. You can choose any background that you'd like. Not only do they provide more skills and proficiencies, they also help flesh out your character's backstory and life before adventuring. Were you a noble with a high house or a reclusive hermit finding peace in meditation? This information might inspire you while role-playing. Now, if you've been following along on the Character Mancer, you might have noticed I didn't go over every spell or weapons or some other fun stuff like that. That's because there are so many options to choose from. The notes on them pretty much explain what they do. How you equip your character is pretty much in line with the vibes you're going for with your character. So have fun with that. Okay, now that you have your character sheet, all the numbers, abilities, and equipment right in front of you might feel very overwhelming, but it's actually not. For most of the game, you'll only be looking at little sections at a time. Oh, the DM wants me to roll stealth. Cool, stealth is found in this section, and all I do is click it. Oh, I want to cast a spell. Great, let me click on this spell right here. After a couple minutes of play, you'll be able to scan your character sheet very quickly. And remember, for the most part, the majority of the game are those three steps I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Description, choice, result. Let's get started. Skill checks. Now the majority of play will be found right here in the skill check section. Using our breakdown we mentioned before, here's an example. Your GM describes your character entering a messy study. Books and papers are everywhere and desks are turned over. There's a locked cabinet in the room, but the key is nowhere in sight. Maybe your character says that they want to look through the mess to try to find the key to the cabinet. Now your dungeon master might ask you to roll an investigation check. To do this, roll a d20, the dice with 20 sides. <laughs> then add whatever number is next to your investigation skill. If you're on roll 20, click investigation. That's the result. Okay, like we talked about before, your investigation skill is an intelligence-based skill. So you add your intelligence bonus, but your character is also proficient in this skill. So you add that to your roll too. If you're on roll 20, just click investigation. It does the math for you. If you see two numbers in the chat, the first one is your roll result. And the second one is if you had advantage or disadvantage on that roll. Ignore that unless your game master told you so. Okay, so next, your game master decides how difficult a certain task is by giving a difficulty class number or DC to it. It's up to your GM on whether or not they tell you that number though. It might be a secret. Harder tasks will have a higher DC and easy tasks will be a lower DC. If you roll higher than the DC, then you generally succeed in that task. But if you roll lower, you do not. Depending on your role, the GM will tell you if you were successful in finding the key. Our GM told us it's moderately difficult to find because that key is so small and this room is trashed. We want to roll anyway. We rolled a 17 beating the DC our DM had secretly had and our DM says we found the key. Combat. This same breakdown of play is used in combat as well, but with a few more rules. When combat breaks out, your GM will tell you to roll for initiative. Initiative determines what order the player and enemies will act in. To figure out your initiative, either click on the initiative at the top of your character sheet and roll 20, or roll a d20 and add your dexterity modifier. Now, when it gets to your turn, you have a few choices to make. Every character has a movement speed decided by their race at the top of their character sheet. On your turn, you can move as far as your movement speed allows. This is called a move action. On top of your move action, you also get another action. This action can be used for a variety of things. The most common use is either attacking or casting a spell. Attacking is easy. 
Let's say you tell your GM you want to attack the enemy with your mace. They say, sure, go ahead and roll an attack. Now, just like skill checks, you either click on the weapon you want to attack with on your character sheet, or you roll a d20 and add your strength and proficiency. Okay, most of the time you're going to be attacking with a weapon you are proficient with. Now, characters and creatures have AC, or armor class. This number represents how hard they are to hit. If the total of your roll is equal or greater than the creature's AC, you hit. Otherwise, you miss. Okay, on a hit, you deal damage. Every weapon will have a damage die attached to it. In our example, a mace deals 1d6 damage. That means we roll one six-sided die, and then we add our strength to it. The total is how much damage your attack dealt. If you're using roll 20, just click on mace. Keep in mind the same attack rules apply to your character as well. If the GM says an enemy attacks you, they will roll and tell you the total. If it's equal to or higher than your AC, you take damage. Whenever you take damage, you subtract it from your hit points, the number near the top of the character sheet. Your total starting HP is decided by your class and constitution score. Now, if your HP ever reaches zero, you are not dead actually. You actually fall unconscious. And at the start of every turn, you remain unconscious and have to make a death save. Death saves are easy enough to make, but very nerve wracking. To make a death save, simply roll a d20. If you roll a 10 or higher, that's a success. If it's lower than 10, uh, that's a failure. Mark in successes and failures in the bubbles below your HP. If you ever reach three successes, your character stabilizes. They remain unconscious and at zero hit points, but you don't have to roll death saves anymore. If you hit three failures, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this. Your character's dead. You won't always have to make death saves. There are so many ways your party members can help you. They can heal you with magic or potions or medicine. There are even spells to bring you back from the dead. Bonus action. Okay, in addition to your movement and your regular action, some class abilities and spells can be done in a bonus action. This is exactly what it sounds like. You can take your regular movement and action and also do this as a bonus on your turn. Keep in mind, not all characters will have things they can do as a bonus action. You just might be the lucky one. Game Master Tips. Okay, real quick, if you're liking this video and you wanna see more videos like it, hit the subscribe button and like this video. It really helps me out and shows that people are interested in these videos. Now, everything that we've talked about so far is what both the GM and the players need to know when starting their first game of Dungeons and Dragons. But now let's talk about some tips for just the game master. The rule books. Okay, deciding to run your own game of D&D can be daunting, especially when you start looking through the player's handbook, the monster manual, and the dungeon master's guide. These books contain every rule you can think of when it comes to the game. But don't feel like you need to read each one of these cover to cover before your first session. Playing D&D isn't like a specific card game or board game where there's tight rules. This game is very loose and up to the person running the game. Honestly, I own a lot of D&D books and I rarely read them cover to cover. A lot of DMs get books for inspiration or in-game references and they pull bits and pieces and put it into their own game. Having a general understanding of how gameplay works and using books as a resource during your game is a good way to use them. At the end of the day, you're the game master. Whatever you rule at the table is right. So if you don't want to spend five minutes figuring out how fast a ship can sail west in a storm with winds blowing in from the east, use your best judgment and just say, oh yeah, it's fast. Wing it. The fun comes from how your players react to this stuff. Monsters. Now, as you create your first adventure, you will more than likely choose some monsters for your players to face. Monster stat blocks are basically simplified versions of character sheets. They have ability scores, skills, HP, and attacks just like players do. But one thing that monsters have that players don't 
is a challenge rating, or CR. Now, CR can be used at a glance to see if a monster is too strong or too weak for your players. A good rule of thumb is that four adventurers should be able to take on a monster with a CR equal to their level without too many issues. For example, four players of level four should have an okay time fighting a Banshee whose CR is, you guessed it, four. Don't overprepare. Dear God, don't overprepare. If you're running a pre-written adventure, make sure you give it a full read, but be ready to improvise stuff. The written word is a guide. You don't have to do everything exactly like the adventure says. Feel free to take things out and add things in. Your players will never follow the adventure to the letter, so don't even worry about that. Now, if you're trying to write your first adventure, great. Good for you. That's awesome. Second, start very small, please. Build a small town with one or two places in it. You don't have to build the entire world. Build a tavern, uh, maybe a general store. Then have an adventure hook and start playing. Worry about all the surrounding areas later. By the end of the session, you'll have a good idea of how fast or slow your players move through your world. Yes, and improvising is a huge part of being a game master. You can never account for everything that your players are going to want to do. And honestly, that's part of the fun of the game. If your players want to try something maybe a little unorthodox, let them. And if they fail, they fail. Who cares? Remember step two in my description. Choice. But I will say it is important to note that it is 100% okay and honestly your responsibility to say no if a player or players want to do something inappropriate or offensive to other people at the table. You should say no. You're at a table with friends. You should never feel uncomfortable, especially at the expense of someone wanting to have fun at a game. If you're looking for a way to get on the same page with people at your table, I'm going to leave a link in the description below on how to run a session zero. Now, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe and leave me a message in the comment section. I always check the subscriber comments first. Until then, I'm Carlos Luna, and this was Learn How, Play Now.